I personally would like to see statues of people that we should all idolize. Black power! Black power! Our Confederate statues represent love and honor for our mother's son. It's hurtful heritage. first person who made up the Confederate flag meant for it to be divided, meant for black people and white people to be divided, not together. Under a perfect sky, out on splendid Monument Avenue unveiled an enduring memorial to Jefferson Davis. Toward the end of the Civil War, you began to see people like Jefferson Davis begin to popularize this idea, knowing that they're going to lose, popularizing this idea that the South will rise again. The governor spoke feelingly of the lost cause. I wish to assure you that there is no state in the South where the memories of the war between the states, where heroism and glory of the Confederate soldiers are more deeply cherished than in the state of Virginia. And what they meant was the those supporters of slavery, those supporters of the racial status quo. Confederate statues went up by the dozens in the late 1800s and early to mid 1900s, nearly a hundred dotting Virginia, giving it more Confederate markers than any other state. While each stone is etched with words of honor, the language spoken and written by those who mounted and celebrated their masterpieces help tell the story of what they stood for. Rocky Mount, known as the moonshine capital of the world, Southwest Virginia, 24 miles south of Roanoke, population 5,000 nestled along the Blue Ridge Mountains. No no cracking the veneer of small town charm. What do we want? Justice! What do we want? Now! Our heartfelt cries for racial justice, vibrating around the Confederate symbol they want to come down. Leading the challenge is cosmetologist and Rocky Mountain native Bridget Craighead. What do you feel every time you see that monument? I feel that my county hates me. Every time I ride past that monument, anytime I go to court, even for a parking ticket, I feel that as soon as I walk in the building, I'm being judged because of the color of my skin. I know what they fought for was wrong, but in order for us to move forward, we have to come with these people with love. They are expecting us to come and tear this statue down. We are not going to do that. We are going to have them come and take it to where they want it. Because there's no way this statue can stand here and this building does its job. It is no way that can happen in 2020. The statue standing in the center of town is of a Confederate soldier erected only 10 years ago in 2010 after the original one assembled in 1910 was destroyed in a truck accident. On this late summer afternoon, protesters peacefully lay claim to about a mile through downtown to spread their message that demands change. The black people might feel like they need to leave here. If black people, black voices are not being honored or represented by the county, then why should we stay in a place that doesn't care about our voice? It's hurtful heritage that shouldn't be allowed to be displayed at a place where all people go to get justice. I think about how this country distorts its history and how they make heroes out of people that actually fought against this country. Basically, until this country comes to grips with its true history, it will be very difficult for us to heal and come together and move forward. This is for life. This is for life. The unveilings drew the most prominent politicians from the Democratic Party at the time to the stage. In Rocky Mount, it was Congressman E.W. Saunders 
who once declared as party chair, Democrats of Virginia are now, as they have always been, in favor of white supremacy. Rocky Mount in Franklin County pays tribute to native sons Jubal Early, a Virginia lawyer, politician, and Confederate general, and Booker T. Washington, former slave, educator, author, and presidential advisor. And they have a picture of Jubal Early and Booker T. Washington inside the courthouse. Hanging side by side. Downtown on the former slave plantation grounds of the Early Inn or the Grove still sits Early's original law office. Just outside of town is the Booker T. Washington National Monument. But it's Jubal Early who's honored by the monument that was funded by the United Daughters of the Confederacy chapter that bears his name even today. To this crowd, you can't separate this statue from Jubal Early's words. The generation in the southern states which defended their country in the late war found amongst them four million of the descendants of those degraded Africans. The almighty creator had stamped them indelibly with a different color and an inferior physical and mental organization. Reason, common sense, true humanity to the black, as well as the safety of the white race, require that the inferior race should be kept in a state of subordination. Jubal Early's post-war activities were in a large part trying to enhance the myth of the lost cause. He wanted to have these monuments built, and not just monuments for soldiers. He wanted everywhere to have these larger monuments that loom over people. Jubal Early to the UDC over there is their hero. Author Elizabeth Greer was once an associate member of the UDC after she married a lawyer with deep Confederate roots, and they owned the Grove. The Grove had been so pivotal in the dedication of the original statue 100 years earlier. Jubal Early was once an attorney for her husband's family before he fought for the Confederacy in the Civil War. And I think he became more and more dug in for the lost cause because he hadn't surrendered. So if they're gonna leave it, I hope they at least amplify the history in a way that everyone of every race and culture can walk up to it and see something right there on the spot that explains Rocky Mount's role and Jubal Early's role mm -hmm. and Booker T. Washington's role. Booker T had more influence in the whole world than any of those Confederate generals did. When you see something that is not right, not fair, not just, you have to speak up. You have to say something. A celebration at the town's farmer's market punctuates today's demonstration. Progress, they feel, is made. We do homemade chili, homemade slaw, hand cut onions. Um, you can have it any way that you want it. The dads are the all beef. White legs are in some of these fancy recipes, and everybody says, hmm, I got everything but quail eggs. Same place, some different attitudes. It's just a really nice community to live in, friendly. This is God's world. He made it, he created it. And all of this nonsense of hate, and I get it, all black lives matter, all white lives matter, all Indian lives matter, all Chinese. We have to come together. A lot of people see it as a symbolism of racism, 
I personally don't because they put it there to kind of um, represent the fact that their parents, their dads had died. They were Confederate soldiers. Well, it probably needs to be put at a different place, maybe. Why tear down history? You know, um, I don't, I don't want to get too technical, but, you know, we have Martin Luther King streets. I ain't got a problem with that. So that's what it comes down to. You're hurting people. And if that monument signifies something that hurts somebody, I don't understand why it's still up. that we should all idolize. I want to see statues of people that remind us of hope, that remind us of equality, and remind us of freedom. People like Elizabeth Cady Stan, people that fought for women's rights. I want to see people like John Lewis. Bill, there's nothing to protect the young children and old women who must face police jobs and fire hoses in the South while they engage in peaceful demonstrations. All people who understood the power of African Americans and that just because you are African American doesn't mean you're less than. In its present form, this bill will not protect the citizen of Danville, Virginia, who must live in constant fear of a police state. It will not protect the hundreds and thousands of people who have been arrested upon Trump charges. Today, the cornerstone of the monument to the soldiers of the lost cause will be laid in Portsmouth with appropriate ceremonies. These men went out to fight in a cause they believed to be a just one. They died for that cause. The monument dedication celebrations were grand, the gatherings impressive, and the prayers and speeches charged with lofty praise of the Civil War Confederate dead, but often laced with words that sent another clear message. You can look at all of these speeches that are given and there are these ideas that are, are pointing you in the direction of the real intent. Use us, most gracious God, survivors by thy mercy of the Confederate Army. Use us and our children. Use the whole Southern people as co-workers with thyself in fulfilling the bright designs of thy providence for this great republic and for the Anglo-Saxon race. That's what they meant when they're, when they're saying that, that these are the real white people. These are the white people who are the purest white people, which in and of itself is a myth too. Um, but, you know, but that's the reason for referencing Anglo-Saxon. No group worked harder to scrape the skies with Confederate stone than the United Daughters of the Confederacy. Founded in 1894 and headquartered in Richmond, these elite Southern women's handiwork could be seen in just about every county and town in the South. They became known as the leading lost cause organization. It is weaving a false narrative so that you feel good about the myth that you're clinging to. That's what the lost cause was all about. Copious minutes of the 1907 National Convention in Norfolk paint a clear picture of how they describe their intentions, a firm purpose to revive and record the true history of valor, courage, and chivalry of the Confederate soldier. So the Daughters of the Confederacy took up this charge with uh, considerable energy because they were protecting what protected them and their privilege. Updates on fundraising to build monuments were always a focal point of their meetings. So was their mission to indoctrinate future generations to the Confederate way, giving their blessing to textbooks that had to pass a certain test outlined in the book, A Measuring Rod, prepared by a UDC historian. Warning. Reject a book that speaks of a slaveholder of the South as cruel and unjust to his slaves. In annual convention minutes, books about the Ku Klux Klan are recommended, and the Klan is referred to as a wonderful organization. 
face to face with what the UDC called their labors of love, protesters say they come from hearts that harbored hate. It's the ugly history that connects the monuments to the outrage seen on the streets. Instead of saying, well, y'all need to just get over slavery. Really? Get over, get over really? it. Really? Right. Today, the UDC says they totally denounce any individual or group that promotes racial divisiveness or white supremacy. And the state still provides them funds to maintain Confederate cemeteries and graves. $665,000 just since 2014. Because it was a different time in America, because there was rampant racism and all. Frank Ernest is the chief of heritage defense for Virginia's Sons of Confederate Veterans. We just feel that this idea that a South that is completely devastated, that is trying, fighting to come back like a, like a war-torn Europe, can come up with the money to make these monuments. And if you see, some of them are just amazing just to irritate another part of the population, the African-American. That's just a well, ludicrous. If you know that history, what would make you say that monument still deserves to be up? then if you go by that standard, you have to date down every monument of Abraham Lincoln, because he said as much or worse as about the inferiority of the African-American. Should they be in museums? Should they just be in another place? Cemeteries, museums? No. When you have this statue, like the Robert E. Lee statue, when you have statues like Stonewall Jackson, all people who fought on the Confederate side, all people who fought to make sure that people who live in America today, their ancestors, and even sometimes themselves, are put in bondage, I believe that that is not something that is worth celebrating, that is not something that is worth being honored, that that is not something that we as a country need to all sit down and praise. All right, we got to say what we always say. Good afternoon, Dixie. We're in Surrey County, Virginia, and we're showing you that the statue has been taken down. So that's why it's relevant that I speak today because I am a descendant and my husband is a descendant of the Confederate soldier. So I stand here to protect our Confederate statues. I fly my Confederate flag for love and honor for our family. I understand that you have your heritage, but what about mine? By you having this and waving it around, that's telling me and my ancestors that you don't matter. We're in the celebration era, 1890 to 1920, mourning became celebration. Monuments in city centers, parks, battlefields, in small towns and rural counties like this. It was the courthouse, not the cemetery where sculptures of Confederate soldiers were placed. Because what happened at the courthouse and the public square was supposed to reflect the values of the wider community. And right where Wendy Hazlett stands marks a tragic spot. During that celebration era, it's where African-American Reuben Cole was lynched, accused of raping a white woman. He was taken out of the jail by masked men, hanged on the first tree and literally riddled with bullets. The wretch pleaded piteously for mercy, protesting his innocence all the while. It's wrong for racist hate groups to get to pick and choose, right? What history can be acknowledged in public and what can't? Here's where we are coming from, all right? We want all statues and monuments to be taken down, like the ones that pertain to black history, Black Lives Matter never would have had to been said if black lives didn't matter at some point. White lives have always mattered, it, it, specifically in the United States. White lives have always mattered. It's down. I want it. I want it on a truck. I want it to go to Shenandoah Valley Battlefield. That's why I'm here. I have a right. That's my statue, my family, my history. starting point was down by the river and you saw people and you heard bands and you heard singing and it was just a, a good good day the memory of that good day in Tappahannock Virginia 
lingers in Carol Harper's mind. You would dress up in your dressing clothes. Emancipation Day, April 3rd, the date Union troops took over the Confederate capital of Richmond in 1865 in an operation in which black troops were first to enter the city. Tappahannock began celebrating that moment in grand style in the 1870s until the early 1950s. Thousands would flood the street right by the courthouse as described in the book Uprooted and Transplanted from Africa to America by Harper's cousin Lillian McGuire. They came in the early years by horse-drawn buggies, wagons or by foot. Then, as the years passed, they came by bus. It might be the last flyer advertising the 3rd of April celebration. This is another view of the parade, and you see all the American flags waving. Harper's parents were very involved in the organization of the events. This is my father, Thomas Delmas Harris. And this is his wife, my mother, Esther Lewis Harris. The celebration stood the test of time through the rise of Jim Crow, not deterred by the distinct addition of a 27-foot high granite Confederate statue right in the middle of the public square, erected in 1909. Every time we pass this, whether we know it or not, subconsciously, it's there telling us or reminding us of what some people, not all, feel in this county about slavery and black people in particular. I feel like that monument is a symbol of hatred. It's a symbol of white supremacy. Tappahannock native Rodney Sidney II is leading the charge to bring the monument down. And the difficult part is, as far as some of the people in the town who have relatives here, is that they feel like this is an honor to their relatives. You know, and you know, for me, I feel like for my relatives, this is a, a, a dishonor. Supporters of this monument tell only stories of bravery, of how the 9th Virginia Cavalry died for the lost cause, fought and gave their lives in 15 engagements from the Battle of Bull Run to the Battle of Five Forks, protecting their homes, their sovereignty. Were these people brave? I can't argue with that. But the fact that they fought to keep my ancestors enslaved you know, I can't respect that. It's just like they said, if you if you take down all this stuff, will history repeat itself? And we can't do away with history. His, it happened. It happened. We're not trying to erase history. We want the true history to be told. The good, the bad, and the ugly. In the words written on the day the monument went up, the speaker who attracted the most attention was Governor Noel of Mississippi. The monument bears names of the governor's relatives. Edmund Noel authored the law that led to what became known as the White Primary, which excluded black citizens from political party membership and participation in its primaries. In his words, the law made white supremacy forever assured. This monument makes Sidney think about a name that's not etched in stone, Louis Corbin, his great, great, great grandfather. He escaped slavery. Uh, he w went down to Hampton, Virginia. He joined uh, the, the Union Navy and came back and fought. He served on the USS Ella, a Union Navy ship used as a patrol vessel on the Confederate waterways. It really just energized me even more to remove this monument because his name is, is not on there. There's only names of dead people who are in the Confederate Army. There's no one honoring real Americans like my great, great, great grandfather. So, you know, for, for me, I feel energized by his spirit. That spirit has hit the streets of Tappahannock and hundreds join in the call for the statue to come down. We had 300 people march through town of Tappahannock. Um, we have had subsequent rallies. We've had board of supervisors calls. We've had email emails. Uh, we've sent uh, phone calls. So we've done so much. But for now, it still stands. We all understand that slavery is one of those things that we cannot forget. Slavery is one of those things that has a brand on every single person, whether you are white or black in our country, that slavery has made our country into the country it is today.
town of Parksley is in the middle of a huge revitalization project right now designed to draw people back into the town. And they're sending the complete wrong message. They're sending out a message that not all people are welcome here. That message comes in the form of a 30-foot high granite statue with a Confederate soldier at parade rest on top, erected in 1899. The desire for a town to have such a marker of Confederate pride prompted a dispute over its location between Parksley and Accomack County. Accomack angry that the structure would not be in front of the courthouse, where people can see it and remember what it stands for. But Parksley, out fundraising Accomack by $100, got the honor, placing it right by the train tracks, a perfect view for passengers riding through town. Why is something that is so damaging to another person so important for you to keep up? On the day of the unveiling, a large Confederate flag floated from a pole 60 feet in height. It was attended by a vast throng of people from every section of the county. When the cornerstone was laid, Featured speaker, prominent judge R.T.W. Duke wrote in his personal diary, it was a pleasant day. At another Confederate commemoration, his words, I who believe that slavery was right and emancipation a wrong and a robbery. The justification for the statue was very clear. This was very much about perpetuating the uh, values of the Confederacy. There's multiple quotes um, regarding the building and the statue stating that it's important for their kids and their grandchildren and their grandchildren's grandchildren to know that they were on the side of right and that they were fighting for the true values of the republic which i think you'll see reflected in the writing on the statue town council voted to sell the land on which the statue is located to the sons of confederate veterans for one dollar that way, the controversy over whether to take it down would no longer be in their hands. Member Dan Matthews now regrets his vote. I'm upset that it took me into my 40s to know most of these stories. Yeah. Right? Right. To know yeah. what's going on. Because, exactly. and I'll say, you know, I grew up a white kid in a white school with white mm -hmm. teachers, mm -hmm. and we used history books written by white people that right. told yeah. the world about white people, mm -hmm. by yeah. white people. And yeah. everybody did here too. And so it's this whole emotional thing of, you know, we're not destroying history. You're just learning a part of history you never knew. I'm going to take care of that. I'm going to look into The it. town attorney later revealed that through further research, Parksley did not own the land to even sell. And the real owner is a mystery. Matthews is skeptical. So uh, it doesn't end the conversation, it just delays a little bit while we do some more research to figure out, you know, who is actually responsible for it, if not us. This is Mr. John Mitchell, the fighting editor of the Richmond Planet, all black newspaper. A black man with a newspaper in the capital of the Confederacy at the turn of the 20th century, way before Black Lives Matter, had a fist, a black fist raised as his logo for the paper. There are those who argue the erection of the monuments was simply a reflection of the times, but a potent and influential voice of opposition came from the Richmond Planet and its young editor, John Mitchell Jr. He used the power of the pen. His writings carried the weight of the rise of Jim Crow, and before that, the dismantling of Reconstruction, the period after the Civil War that gave African Americans a voice in government where they gained congressional seats. That was seen as horrible 
by many whites because not only were these individuals being recognized as citizens of the country, but the most important thing that a citizen can do is cast a vote. Confederate idolizers often spoke of Reconstruction at monument unveilings, calling it an awful calamity, a war penalty. All the while, monuments continued to fill the landscape across the South. John Mitchell was watching and listening in real time. The former Confederate officers were now, once again, reseated as state legislators, having fought and killed Americans. So they had a new cause to undo and unravel Reconstruction, to remind African Americans at every turn of their alleged inferiority. And so the statues are erected in that vein. In 1890, Mitchell decried the installation of the Robert E. Lee statue, writing, this glorification of states' rights doctrine, the right of secession, and honoring of men who represented that cause, fosters in this republic the spirit of rebellion and will ultimately result in handing down to generations unborn a legacy of treason and blood. As the tens of thousands gathered to dedicate their Confederate hero in bronze, they heard these words, let it stand for patriotic hope and cheer. If a day of national gloom and disaster shall ever dawn upon our country, let it stand as the embodiment of a brave and virtuous people's ideal leader. But in the paper in another part of town, solemn words, the statue at Richmond seems like a weak and clumsy protest against the flood of years. For near at hand lay the dismantled marketplace where over two centuries men were bought and sold. And that brings us to what we are seeing and hearing today. We gotta let people know that we matter. It's not that everybody else doesn't matter. It's just that we haven't really mattered, ever. We're here for freedom. Ain't no justice in this town. The movement to take down the monuments merges with the fight for fair policing, collectively making the call for justice grow even louder. That story of the Civil War is something that takes up some literal physical space as well as space in our minds. Activist and community facilitator Chelsea Higgs Wise says the daily gatherings and demonstrations around the sacred Confederate circle that surrounds Robert E. Lee in Richmond are about reclaiming space. After Governor Northam announced that the statue would come down earlier this year, the issue is still in court as supporters immediately sued. Whether we realize it or not, we're born into this. It's now part of our generational trauma here in the fallen capital of the Confederacy. So in this movement, since George Floyd in May 29th is when Richmond decided to uprise. Since then, we have been reclaiming space. The reclamation comes with renaming this space the Marcus David Peters Circle after a mentally ill black man who lost his life in 2018 when he was shot by a police officer. Since the killing of George Floyd, Virginia has removed the most Confederate symbols than any other state, with at least 40 now gone. Because we cannot remake history. What we have to do is be more inclusionary and tell more stories. I, I think they should stay. I think, however, I think you need to build a monument right next to them of those African Americans that serve from the same county or the same city and honor them equally. It represents love and honor for our soldiers. I have ancestors that didn't own slaves. Other people do too. At the same time, voters in small towns are electing through referendums to keep the statue standing. But we're trying to tell them that we do have an issue here, but they're not listening to us. They don't want to hear that they have been wrong for years. We are going to move forward and we are going to gain our freedom. 
But regardless, we are not stopping, and this statue is coming down. I'm threatened or intimidated by the simple fact that we as America, a land where we're all supposed to be free, a land where we're all supposed to be equal, is still having the conversation of how one race is superior to the other. And as many times people have marked, we are still having the same conversations, we are still having the same issues, and it scares me. It scares me that I may not get the same opportunities because of the color of my skin. It scares me that even when I grow up, I'm going to have to attend these marches because there are going to be people in this world that still don't understand the importance of equality and what equality means for every single citizen, especially in a country where we're all bragging about how free we all are when that is simply not the case.